But you can see, you can see how he 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 goes back and forth. He describes one group, then he'll in contrast he describes the other. Then he goes back to the other group, then he describes, and then he describes what one group does and what the other, and he goes back and forth. So that he's painting a picture, just like he did in Romans 1. He talked about those who function by faith and he uses the faith principle, and then he talks about those who function in unbelief. And you see the same pattern here in chapter 2. Because in verse 17, he's going to address, specifically address the people who should know better, but don't. <laughs> Which is us religious people who think we're so right when all the non-religious people are so wrong. And we're the ones that are supposed to know better than to have, take that position. <clears throat> so he's going to come down hard on uh, the Jews here because they're the ones who have the law and they're supposed to supposed to have the experience of applying that law to themselves when the Gentiles who are new in the faith are, are trying to grow to understand the gospel. It's, it's kind of like, and I'm, I know I'm, I'm meddling now, but it's kind of like in our churches when, when us older members in the church are so intolerant and so, so intolerant of new people coming in because they dress wrong or they look wrong or they talk wrong. It's like, excuse me, <laughs> you know, they're the people that are just new to the church. Of course, they're going to do things wrong, right? Mm -hmm. and, and those of us who've been walking with God supposedly for all these years, we're supposed to be very patient and very tolerant and very flexible because we know how big God's love is. We know how much he forgives. We know how much because we've lived it. So we're, we're supposed to be the ones that are flexible. Not, and yet it's, it gets switched around. The people who come in the door are flexible. And those of us who have been sitting in churches for years are so hard and inflexible and intolerant. No, it has to be done this way. Where's that written? Well, it's not. So <laughs> why? Why am I setting up a standard that God has not set up? You know, so this is what Paul is actually doing. He's, he's really, this letter is really hardest on the Jews because he expects them to know more because they had the law and they had the time and space to process these things. Yeah. The Gentiles who were just hearing the gospel for the first time, he doesn't expect them to be mature in their, in their, in their experience yet, as yet. The, the level playing field, I, I think, is what Paul's talking about there in 14 and 15 is that it's within um, the heart and it's within the mind and the conscience, um, whether you're Jew or Gentile or whoever you are, barbarian, that's the level playing field in terms of your relationship to God and the choices you make. Yeah. Amen. That's right. <clears throat> and this phrase, the law is written on your heart. You know that every Jew that reads that knows exactly what he's talking about. Jeremiah chapter 31 about the new covenant. And how the law was not to be written on stone, but it was to be written on the tablet, the tables of our heart. That's the new covenant that he's just, that he's that he's uh, and any any Jew reading that would know exactly what he's talking about, which is totally contrary to what happens at Sinai when it's written on stone, which is what all the prophets were trying to move God's people beyond Sinai when it was written on stone to get it to, to be an experience where it was written on their heart and their mind. Well, that's why the Shema is so important, right? Because that's exactly what the Shema is. The, 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 the word of God written on our hearts and our minds, that, God's, that we love the Lord of God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all our mind. That the words that we, that, that, that we, these words I speak today are to be upon your heart, to be in you. See, that's the part of the Shema that's amazing. The Shema is the idea of listening and thinking and choosing wisely. means I'm listening, which means I'm taking in the word of God. Yeah. And I'm listening. But then I'm thinking, which means the word of God is allowing me now, transforming my mind so I can actually think and reason according to reality. That's the power of the word of God. And then, then I choose properly and I do it. Well, that power comes from the word of God as well. So once I receive the word of God, I listen, I receive the word of God, then it, it fixes my mind so I can think and it empowers me to do what is right. That, all, all, this, all that comes from, from, the, from God. It comes from the word of God, the power of God. It's righteousness by faith. How about this from the Acts of the Apostles? Their minds have grasped the significance of the familiar prophecies so long obscured by tradition and misinterpretation. Their hearts have been filled with gratitude to God for the unspeakable gift he bestows upon every human being who chooses to accept Christ as a personal savior. 
<laughs> Amen. <That is> good. <laughs> and you see the three elements. They're listening, they're thinking, and they're choosing. That's right. Yeah, that lady must have understood the eternal gospel, huh? <laughs> Just a little. <laughs> you know, I, I set out to... Um, I've seen tracks all my life explaining what the gospel is. And so I thought one day, you know, I, I should write an explanation of the gospel. And, and then I got to looking and I got to thinking and I said, wait a minute, it's already been done. <laughs> Steps to Christ is the greatest explanation of the gospel I have ever read. Who am I to rewrite that? <laughs> so yeah. I, when I went, if people ask me, you know, what's the gospel? You know, I just hand them the book and I say, there you go. <laughs> yep. I hear you. That's my, I, the book that I love to hand out. That's my favorite book to hand to other people because it has nothing to do with try, get, trying to tr get people to join my church. I'm not trying to get, make choices for them. I'm just here, 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 you know, here, there's the steps to Christ, you know, and I, and I just share, I said, I've read, I've read the book a thousand times and, and it's a, great book it's been a blessing to me maybe it'll be a blessing to you yeah yeah the the word whether it's you know god's you know holy word or the testimonies they're ultimately just the seed of the gospel and the, the, the way that they really see the gospel is in the fruit <laughs> you know when you look <laughs> at a seed, you compare a seed to the fruit that the seed produces people would choose well i want the fruit <laughs> That's when they can really see what it what it means when it comes to maturity. Amen. So um, it's it's yeah. revealing the fruits that that are, are going to help people to know what the gospel is. Yeah. Amen. And that's why Paul here in Romans Romans two is talking about the fruits, right? He's talking about the maturing what you see. So he talks about both the positive mm -hmm. and the negative in terms of the maturing of the process. Yeah, this is, see the big. I think if we went slower at the beginning of the book of Romans, if we went slower, then we would have much more insight into what comes later, and that we would not Christianity would not be so confused about the gospel as if somehow God's law is contrary to His grace, or that or that that works of obedience are somehow contrary to to righteousness by faith. That this this confusion comes from this confusion comes from a, a, a misunderstanding of the gospel. Oh, yeah. And if you take a look at the lives of uh, the pioneers of our church, and uh, after the disappointment and how they grew and came to understand righteousness by faith, they were the hardest working people alive. Yeah. So, so you know, as your faith grows, so do your works because the works are just a result of what's already happened within you and uh, set the world on fire you know builds up a church from a few hundred people to what's now 18 million yeah 21 what, what, what happens mostly is that is that religious people grab hold of they think religion is about behaviors, and they think by changing their behavior that God accepts them. And so religion becomes a works behavior thing, and that I have to do it, I have to do this and not do that to gain God's acceptance. Mm -hmm. But when you begin to understand the gospel, that God loves you, that Jesus died for you, that he, that he accepts you as you are, and that his, it's his love that transforms you, then you begin to realize it's the gospel. And so what, ha what has happened throughout the years is that religious, just like it happened to Judaism, tends to, religious people tend to, to, to fall into behaviorism and they start set setting standards of what righteousness is and then, and then measuring other people according to whatever that standard is. But they're not looking at themselves. They're not measuring themselves. So, of course, that's where you get all the hypocrisy, you know, the, all the double standard business. And that's what religion gives religion and actually gives Jesus a black eye because people that don't understand the gospel have fallen into behaviorism, thinking that if they change their behaviors, they can win God's acceptance. Mm -hmm. And that's that's no gospel at all. 
And so there is a there is a tract going down the, the tract of, of legalism. There is a tract that many people have gone down uh, that needed to be delivered out of it. Yeah. Of course, then there's the other ditch on the other side is that we're saved by grace and it doesn't matter what you do. So you can just do anything and it doesn't matter. So, there, you know, there's your two ditches. So the ditches they, are real. Do they maybe make the mistake of thinking that if they change their behavior that they are transformed, not realizing that only God can change your nature within? Well, yes, but see, see, all of us come out of darkness, right? So all of us, when you were brought up as a child, you were told that you were a good person if you obeyed and you were a bad person if you disobeyed. And then if you disobeyed, you were punished and that punishment atoned for your bad work. So, so this, this concept, behaviors concept of good and bad gets ingrained in us as little children and it takes time for God to get us out of Egypt and get us out of seeing God as a Pharaoh that's going to either reward or punish you for good works or bad, punish you for bad works. And, 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 and God is trying to say, God, I'm not that way. I'm not, you know, God didn't bring the children of out of Israel to be their new Pharaoh. No, he, no, he's, and, but it takes time for them to, to realize everything that's been ingrained in their thinking about their perspective of, perspective or perspective of reality to be to be transformed to see god for who he truly is and to see reality for what it really is and then start making the changes in their own thinking that's the process of the gospel that god's trying to bring us out of mm -hmm. and it takes time for that so there's a legalistic part to all of us and there's a grace there's a there's a liberal grace part of us, all of us. There, I mean, all of us have some of those two ditches in us. And God is trying to bring us out of both of those ditches because both of them end in death. Well, the en enemy is very subtle. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's sort of the case that, you know, if, if your works don't change, well, then you're really not accepted. But, but changing your works doesn't make you accepted you know the, the the opposite isn't the case and yet he that that's what satan puts the focus on is, is the sort of the opposite conclusion that you would logically come to but it's not the case just like nothing that you do you know earns you in, any favor mm -hmm. but you know you, you still need to be doing good um and so you know satan is very you know, diabolical and how he, he twists things to, to deceive. Yeah, and Satan doesn't have to follow any rules either. Yes. He, he can play both ends against the middle, and uh, he's still going to end up with the end of result of his actions. So nothing changes for him. It only changes for us. So, yeah. Right. And he uses he uses our our fallen nature and the twisting of our minds. He uses that against us to to try to keep us enslaved. But see, the gospel is to set us free. Yeah, that's why I, I love the ex story. The Exodus story is so profound. Uh, there's a reason why uh, most of the Bible and the gospel is based on the story, the Exodus story that God is trying to to take these slaves who have been brainwashed and taught in the ways of Egypt and brought under the thumb of Pharaoh that, you know, good behavior gets rewarded, but bad behavior gets punished. And, and, you know, and then we have this idea about God that we carry along with this picture of Pharaoh in our minds. But when God takes us out of Egypt, he's, tr he, he's trying to, He's trying to take Egypt out of us. He's trying to change our perspective of, of who God is and who we are and then what, it, what, it, what he's really trying to do. And then we begin to realize, oh, no, behavior is not good enough. You know, go up to, oh, Moses, you go up the mountain and whatever God tells you, we'll do it. No, that's not good enough. No, that's not what God desires. No, God wants to know you. God wants to talk to you. God wants to dwell in you and he wants you to dwell in him. Right. So the, when the reality of God breaks through, then it's like, wow, how could I have been so dumb? But see, this, that, that patience, God's patience with us is supposed to then bring us to the place of patience with other people. 
Well, I think Satan knows more about what's embedded in me than I do. Well, yeah, I, I'm only because he studied fallen creatures. He knows himself and he studied fallen creatures for a long time. So there, therein lies the truth. But the thing is, Satan is just another fallen creature. And I, 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 I just, I, that's why I keep telling people, my, my greatest enemy is me. I, you know, we can, we can, yes, Satan's this, and yes, the devil is that, and yes, Lucifer is this, and Lucifer that, but you know what? He's, he's not my pro, he's not my one number one problem. No, no, my number one problem is me. And if you I can't realize do anything about him, me, then my number one savior is Jesus, then I don't have to worry about the other part. Uh, that's one of the things I think that's so hard that we always want to look at other church members and judge ourselves against them, as you said, rather than pointing to Christ. Don't look at any other church member and what they're doing or not doing, but keep your eyes focused on Christ and worry about your relationship with him. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and the, idea, year, the idea that um, to be patient with other um, goes back to the leveling playing field that he speaks about that the law is in the heart and in the conscience and that's the bridge um and that that makes us right. all on the same playing field that we can understand and understand that god's working on their conscience working on their heart as he's working on mine and therefore we don't judge we be, we're gracious to the other we realize it's the holy spirit that is then working on the conscience and as we're aware of that and in the heart, you know, we're much more gracious and more forbearing and long suffering with the other. And as you said, patient. Amen. That's the level playing field. Amen. He's created us all Amen. in that way. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And and let me add, Dan, to what you're sharing, what James is saying as well, is that it, it doesn't mean that I'm blind to what other people are doing. But the point is, I'm not looking at them critically to find out what they're doing is wrong to condemn them. I mean, if I sh if I or Roy showed up to, to the Zoom meeting and you see a cigarette in my mouth and a tattoo on my arm, then hopefully you would say you would see oh something's wrong, Pastor Raymond. Something's wrong with him. He needs he, something's wrong. He needs love. He needs to be he needs to be brought back. You, you know. So when you see other people and you see the evidence of them that sin is overcoming them you're supposed to reach out and love to them and not well you're doing this wrong no what's wrong you need something's wrong you need love you need to see a, a clear picture of god and so so we, we 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 pay attention we're not supposed to close our eyes and deny what we see going around around us but when we see other people and we see the evidence of them sin overcoming them and, and being victorious over them and ruling over their faculties we're supposed to in love reach out to them and say how can i help you what's wrong what's up why are you turning away from god why are you looking for for love and 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 support and, and assurance and acceptance in other areas of this world that that's that's, that's not going to feed it's not going to give you give you what you need and so you know, there's nothing wrong with us being aware of what other people are struggling with, struggling with, but but the heart of love sees the need and reaches out to them rather than saying, well, you can't do that here. You know, we're only right, you know, that all that foolishness that we talk about. One, so, one needs to go, one needs to go a little deeper than the behavior, as you say, and look at that their their conscience is being burdened, their conscience is being attacked, and appeal right. to that. And it's hurting people. It's hurting people that hurt other people. And it's hurting people that do things that are self-destructive. Mm -hmm. So when I was at the academy, when I was at the academy, I would go to school, right? And I'm, I'm teaching these, these kids and I'm with them all the time. And then, you know, you get in class and one day this kid's real disruptive and he's, and he's causing all kinds of problems. Well, so, so, you know, so I go up to him, I put my arm around him, you know, how are we doing? What's wrong? What's going on? And, and I don't beat him up because he, you know, he did this bad behavior. No, the bad behavior is, a, is, a cons is, is something coming out of him because something's going on in him. And when, and when, and then, you know, most of the time after they, they get this, this hard hardness, 
They'd get off, they'd go past that because they knew I cared. And then they'd open up and the tears would start flowing. Oh, my mom and dad are in court today and they're deciding, you know, who, who, who's going to have my brother, who's going to have my sister. And, and, you know, they start telling you all this hell that they're carrying in their heart. And that's why it's, it, it's being expressed in, in negative behavior. Mm-hmm. And, and, and me telling them, you know, stop the negative behavior as if I solved the problem. Well, that's just stupidity. No, but when you deal with what's really causing the, the, the problem, not the symptom, then when you start, then you say, well, let's pray about that. Let's talk about that. And then all of a sudden, the bad behaviors, they just disappear. They, they're no longer a troublemaker in class. And, and you're the, they're your number one student. And, you know, all this, all the, because, because the real issues that, are, that, they're, that they're carrying inside them are dealt with. Therefore, the fruit that they bear outside of them changes. Yeah. All because somebody cared, reached out in love. Because love changes people. God's love changes us. Yeah. And that's that's the beauty of it. And if you get if you if you teach people just to to, to behave without checking what's going on inside, then you're just you're 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 producing robots that are just out of touch with reality and they're gonna bulldoze over other people. And that's not what we want. By the way, that's what you see in the Bible, right? The Pharisees are just this, this machine, and they have this level of morality, and, and yep, they're going to kill you, and they'll bulldoze over you because they're right. So here, Paul, I mean, of course, Paul knew this, right? Paul's the one running around killing people because he's a Jew, and they're Christians. And so his, they're not doing what he, he, he thinks they should be doing, so he's supposed to kill them. That's his job. And somehow God has given him this job. Well, what kind of God gave you that job, Saul? Well, his picture of God changed when he saw God. And then he, when, when he realized who Jesus was, and then his whole life changed. And that's what's supposed to happen to us. Praise God. <laughs> Praise, God. Praise God for his patience and his forbearing and his long suffering with us. And we, with our white hair or no hair, at the at the age we've been wrestling with God for so long, we should have we we we're supposed to have figured this out a long time ago, and we're still wrestling to figure it out. So how much how more patient should we be with should we be with others who are so who have been so in the process for such a short time? Maybe our slow progress indicates we'll live to a hundred. <laughs> <laughs> 100 is very short sighted. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the way the way the days are flying by now, uh, I can see how a thousand years would go by rather quickly. <laughs> yeah, amen. If only the good die young, why are we still alive? <laughs> <laughs> because we're still young. Julia. You, got, you still got to do this Julia. in God's years. <laughs> What does that tell us about ourselves? <laughs> if only the good. <laughs> We're still in the process is what it tells us. Are we, are, are we in denial? <laughs> well, let's not assume that that phrase is full of truth, eh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, anyways, I just had to throw that in. They can edit that out. <laughs> no, you make sure you leave it in, Don, and make it highlighted. <laughs> Well, what's interesting? What's interesting is that you begin to realize that many of the, what's that phrase you want to use? Remember when they when you take a slogan from a song or something, it becomes becomes something in your mind. Uh, like a stand, uh, it becomes a, a standard you live by or something, right? Your that's motto. what that's what ha- that's what happens to us. Yeah, the model. Thank you. That that's what happens is that we that we when we're young. And, we're, and we haven't thought things through. And most of the time, because we're functioning on our emotions, we grab hold of these, of these, of we, these sayings or these models, these mantras that we, 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 when we, we kind of plant our flag of our personhood saying, well, this is me. Well, of course, that's not true at all. You didn't come up with that saying, and that's not you. But anyways, we, we start adopting things as, as my personhood. And then, and then God, it's the process of God taking us out of our Egypt and then showing us that that mantra is a bunch of foolishness. And why are you accepting that foolishness as your personhood? When I created you, God is saying, I know who you are. You want to know who you are? You need to come to, to me to know who you are. 
And then God slowly starts taking away all these lies that have been embedded in our minds that we accepted as truth. And he starts transforming our mind to see that we believe the lie and, the, and, and our performance, our behavior, and our whole life was dictated by those lies that we believed. And he starts redirecting our life. We become born again. We have a new path. We're a new person. We have a new mantra. And our new mantra is Jesus. Yes. Hey, Pastor Tim. I know one of the favorites for my age was I did it my way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, I didn't come into the church until I was in my 40s. And when I became a Christian and looked back over my life, I saw an awful lot of fails. <laughs> so much for doing it my way. Yeah. Thank you, God, for your patience and your long suffering. <laughs> right. Yes. Thank you, God, for your mercy and your compassion and your kindness. And thank you, God, for, for, for not giving up on me when I gave up on me and you and everything else. Oh, yeah. God I is so a lot when I, when I learned that God wasn't punishing me, I was punishing myself. Amen. When, when I realized that, that was a huge breakthrough. When I realized that God was the sanctuary and i could come back anytime i wanted that's right and never leave if you got what when you get wise you, you'll be like i'm not leaving the sanctuary yeah yeah i'm going to dwell in the house of the lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the lord and to seek him in this temple that was david's desire seems yeah. like a friend of mine told me something like that years ago yeah he probably he probably was crazy though <laughs> What do you mean was? <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah. And, he and, is good. Uh, Pastor, maybe you could talk for a minute about, you know, you know, the basic idea I see, one of the basic ideas I see in the passage here is that, you know, if you do right, you'll be blessed. And if you do wrong, you'll be cursed. Um, and yet, you know, we know in practice, and David talks about it, that, you know, th those who do wrong seem to prosper, and those who do right seem, you know, everything seems to go wrong. Um, so just... The big word there is seem. Yeah, that's right. The big word you is know, seem. For, for a time or for a season. For a season, yeah. yeah. We're talking about well, the everlasting gospel. Yes. Right. So the that, point is that, that time can be quite a long time as far as we measure our lives. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so those who live by live according to the flesh, we say seem to prosper. What they're really, when we say prosper, we, we're really measuring it by the world standards of the flesh, right? Yeah. That they seem they seem to have this, and they seem to have that, and they seem to oh, they seem to be so happy. Well, uh, and of course, that's not true at all. Uh, there, you know, I mean, the whole performance and everything on the outside is just covering up the decay and the and the the mess that's on the inside. So the point is, is that all that is is that those phrases are all measured according to a worldly, earthly standard. Mm -hmm. But 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 tell me, tell me, how many of those people, how many of those people that are succeeding according to the world standards, knows what it's like to spend twenty minutes in the presence of God and hearing His voice? And walking in the light of his presence and knowing the freedom, the freedom that you can have from, from yourself and from your slavery, from your addictions and from your habits. How many of those people know that experience? How many people have seen the glory of God? Well, they have no idea what they're missing. They have no idea what they're trading for the, for the few minutes of pleasure. And, you know, uh, so... You know, again, that's one of Satan's lies, the, the games that he plays with us according to a worldly standard. But see, those people who are who are Christ, they no longer see view things from a worldly perspective. They no longer view things from 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 a from emotional feel good perspective. They view it, but they view things through the eyeglasses of God, through Christ and his righteousness and his glory. His truth that sets free his beauty. And they they see they 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 live in the in reality because they're walking in step with the author of reality. And that's the answer to that question. Satan can give you a lot of junk down here and can make you feel good in the short term, but you know what? The end the, the end thereof is the ways of death. Yeah. 
-hmm. And Moses turned away from the, the standard of success to, to be a servant of God. And, you know, the Bible's full of stories of people who are men of faith, who gave up what the world had to offer. Same as Jesus did with Lucifer and, the, and Satan in the wilderness when Satan was tempting him with the kingdoms of this world. And Jesus said, no, I'm not interested in that. You mean you're going to choose the way of the cross and the way of suffering and the way of, yes, I am. Why? Because that's the path of my father. And, mm -hmm. and being with my father is more important to me than anything. And see, that's what Christians, that's what makes Christians Christians. Mm -hmm. What's more important to me, what's more important to a Christian than anything is Jesus being with him. That's my joy. That's, that's my, that's success. And I don't care what it takes. I don't care if it means I'm in a dungeon or, or mm -hmm. like Paul, I'm being beaten or I'm being whatever, whatever it takes to be with Jesus. That's what I want. Yeah. Amen. That's the answer to those questions. Kind of an interesting dichotomy, but I was just sitting there thinking that, you know, and I think about all my life, uh, I just seem to, in my pain, run from one mess to another, always getting myself in one fix after another, and um, one fail after another. But the good thing about it is God met me there. Amen. That God pursued me and, and met me there and uh, let those things bring me to an end to myself so that I would cry out for help. And um, he met me there. So I, I got to have, I don't regret those things now because it gave me a relationship with him. I hope that made God sense. Is, yep, God is cool. It's Mrs. White makes a comment when we get to heaven, we look back on our life here on this earth. She says that if we could, we would we would not change a thing. Yeah. Because it was the very path that we walked to show us our need for God to save us. And we were who we were. But so we would not have anything change. And that's amazing when you think about if, you know, when you think about it that way, you realize, oh, so when I wake up out of my denial and I'm playing games with reality and this imaginary thing in my mind that I'm carrying, if this, if that, when I, re when I get to heaven and I'm, and I'm really awake and I understand what's going on, then I wouldn't want anything to change. No, don't change a thing. It's like, oh, okay. So our desire to change things now to somehow make it better or make it smoother that's not the path of righteousness that's not the path that leads to life so we need to trust the lord with all of our heart lean not on our own understanding and all the ways acknowledge him and he will direct our path and then whatever he wills that's fine he's the lord dear heavenly father the love that would not let us go thank you so much for who you are thank you so much for your patience and for your kindness and for your forbearance and your long suffering Thank you so much for your mercy and for your love and for your grace. Thank you for loving us when we didn't love ourselves and reaching out to us no matter how far we had fallen. You reached out to us to show us uh, how much you love us and how much you desire to set us free. Just bless us. Bless us as we, as we seek to understand your word and then, and then think, listen, think, and then choose wisely, choose properly to reflect your glory, your character. Oh, Father, we know that we cannot do this apart from you. So we, we thank you for your love. We thank you for sending your son. We ask for the gift of your Holy Spirit. Convict us, uh, convert us, transform us into your image and your likeness, that you will be glorified and that we and others will be saved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.